spelling mistake there. I'll fix it up later. <laughs> As a, on what? Just on the introduction, not in your name. Don't look so worried. It's no drama. I'm not worried. Why, why do you think I'm worried? I have no idea why I think you're worried. Are you not nervous or anything, are you? No. I'll look why after I... you. I don't you worry about that. Why would I be nervous? I have no idea. I have no I, idea. I stand up on stage all the time. I know. I know. So how are you doing, Mr. Julio? I am super well. I That's love so lockdown. Good. Sorry. Just, are you not allowed to say that? Say what? I love lockdown. Really? Why do you love lockdown? Oh, it's just opened up so many possibilities, hasn't it? A little <sighs> bit of soul searching, a little bit of gardening, you know, walking the dogs on a regular basis, meeting new people, making friends, zooming to places that I couldn't drive to at the best of times. So there's a bit of a bit of a good spin on it. I can't say I'd like to do it for the rest of, uh, you know, my career as such, but hey, it's all good at the moment. It's actually funny because you know, your generation um, are, probably, are probably not, and, and mine, I mean, I'm in that generation as well. We aren't as savvy when it comes to technology and uh, and knowing our way around that whole space. It's, it's actually unbelievable. There is like an app for everything. There's a button for everything. There's, there's the ability to just generate so much conversation and be creative through technology it's just like a whole new world I, I think you're right you know I know you're right and the thing of it is that it is a really a new world for me as a result every day there's a learning experience or a challenge but the, it does come with a lot of frustration though Ines a lot of frustration when you you know that that's the button and it's not working so you double click it or you do it one more time and man, the whole world has changed. So can I tell you, my partner Phil, so he's with Amazon, right? So he's he's like a bit of a geek. Yep. And he he's right into the whole technology thing. And I'm like, Darl, it's just not working. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, stop pressing buttons. And I'm like, nothing's working. It's frozen. It. And it's, you know, and it's just like he hates it when I touch, just touch buttons and just start. You know, just working my way, click, 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 and he just goes off his dial at me. I, I don't know. I, I just kind of think it should just work. Absolutely. The printer's not working. Why is the printer not working? <laughs> exactly. I've got it plugged into the computer. What do you mean it can't find the printer? <laughs> it's so funny. So, hey, listen. So today, did you like my um, introduction to you about me being on the Jenny? I think it's... <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, well, you know, in, inventive. Yeah, that's what you do. <laughs> if I was on the Titanic when it was going down, you'd be one person I'd want to have by my side. You'd be just like, we've got this, B, we can do it. You're always yep. like, you're like a rock. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's just a long, a long career of, of, you know, not being phased, I suppose. Not all the time, yeah, but, true. you know, yeah. So different. talking of career, so yes. you've had quite a long career and and you've had you've had a really diverse career as well. I mean, you, you're obviously a very experienced chef by trade and you've worked in across multiple venues. Who and what got you into cooking in the first place? Well, that's an awesome, awesome question. I know, um, I'm pretty clever with these questions. Awesome like, question. Whenever I ask a question, someone will go, that's such a good question. I'm like, were you expecting me not to ask a yeah, good look, question? <laughs> sometimes people don't want to go that far and dive that deep. But for me, I can, I can say, I can honestly say it was my grandmother. Oh, really? Okay. And there's, there's multiple faces to the story. Um, I say my grandmother because I grew up in a household that had the extended family there. So we were living with grandma and grandpa. Um, and 
the big thing was that you woke up to the smell of food and you went to sleep with the smell of food. Did you grow up in, were you born in Australia or were you born in Italy? Uh, wrong and wrong again. I was actually born in Egypt. Really? Yeah. That is amazing. See, it, it, we don't know these things unless we ask. Absolutely. Like, you know, there are stories that, that go along with that. And, you know, the men in my family have been Italian by blood. My grandfather um, was captured in Italy as a prisoner of war. Obviously, he was in Italy, Ness. That means we were on the German side. Right. But he was actually very good friends with Benito Mussolini. Yes, that's right. Exactly. Really? So when he was taken, he wasn't taken to a concentration camp. He was taken to an internment camp, which the fine line is, this was more like the Ritz rather than anything else. So when, when grandfather was shipped to Egypt, they started a whole new life in Egypt. And it, it was, you know, have your own garden, grow your own farm at the back. So feeding people in the internment camp, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my, my grandmother suffered the same fate and she was picked up from Malta and landed in the same camp. My father was born there. Wow. So, yeah, there's, there's a bit of... Uh, there's That's a bit of amazing. history. Of history yeah. See, you know what? Everyone has a story. I tell you what, these sessions, I people say, oh, you know, it's so great. And thank you. So can I tell you, I get so much enjoyment out of these sessions and learning things about people that that are just like, wow. So yeah. cool. Let's just fast forward just for a yep. second because I want to talk about um your journey and and kind of. You, you, you sent some notes through yesterday, which I read, and um, thank you for that. You spoke about three people that really um, that they really had a they had a, a they had a print on your career journey. Who who were they, and and what was that about? Well, you know, I, I'm I'm sure there's been more than more than those three, but yeah, of course. But the, 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 three, the three all came very early in my career. So if I, if I rewind to the beginning, you know, I've always resisted one. I've, I was always going to cook. I know that. I, I know that completely. But I, I try to fight it every step of the way. Uh, the minute I qualified, look, I started off by doing a diploma course, an associate diploma course in hotel management yeah. until I was tapped on the shoulder. Yeah, uh, and, and someone said to me, mate, you, you really need to do this trade certificate. So doing both of those, when I, when I completed all five, the first job I, I got was a, a waiter's job, you know, and, and that was amazing because I saw such a different side of things, you know. And again, the second job I got was a cocktail barman in a nightclub. I was trying not to go to the kitchen. Man, I went, I did HSC so I could, you know, become an, an accountant or I was thinking going to commerce, well, you know, they're everything. Really? I can't Absolutely. Imagine, I can't imagine you being an accountant. I, I can't either. I, can't I mean, either. I know you love your yields. I know that you're passionate about yields. Yes. But, <laughs> but, you know, I just can't picture you being an accountant. So as life led me to full-time in the kitchen, I got to a hotel, and I know you all know it, I got to a hotel called the Camperdown Travel Lodge. Yeah. Now, I've got, you've got to rewind, guys, 1986, yeah, 86, 87. This is a big deal. I didn't go to the Camperdown Travel Lodge. I went to the, oh, my goodness, the Camperdown Travel Lodge, the Claypot Restaurant. And I was employed by a man called Tony Carter. I know Tony Carter. And and Tony was Tony was tough. But not not only was he tough, but in, in 1986, he was just so far ahead of his time. 
you know yeah. he was canadian and he just had some amazing food he'd been he'd traveled he understood things you know out of all the stories i can tell about tony i was employed as the entremetier part of my job was vegetable preparation and the story i always talk sticks in my head so so clearly is that i tony had bought these absolutely magnificent baby yellow squash they were tiny they were you know the champignon size they were just amazing so i quartered them and put them into a tomato sauce because every day i had to come up with something different with these vegetables and he looked at me and said man what are you doing these were perfect before you touched them and that was tony tony taught me how to pull back and just let the food talk for itself yeah that was a long time ago pull back this is at its peak it doesn't need you just bathe it in some hot water mate pull back so talk to me about peter howard what was the influence that peter howard had on your career and and on you as a person well that's the tafe days and, and and let's start that's a rewind to being tapped on the shoulder so i had uh, two chefs to start off with because peter uh, at that stage was doing food service so i was learning food service there um and the two chefs armand and jones one ran a kitchen class and the other one ran a cafeteria class and they both tapped me on the shoulder you know a week apart saying mate you know you're a chef don't you no no i'm, I'm doing this course yeah no really the way you handle the knife the way you do this you really need to do a trade certificate then I got to Peter's class and I was folding napkins at the time. And he walked over and he said, um, that's really good. But I think you do, you handle a knife better. And I went, hang on. <laughs> what? <laughs> Who have you been conspiring with? And he sat me down and had a great little chat. Um, and was very instrumental in the fact that he saw talent there that he thought I should focus in that back of house area and you know in that cooking um organizational skills were there at the time you know i was very excited about presenting things on plates and he just he just picked me up and, and gave me a good talking to her and we've been friends ever since um we've judged together we've we've you know analyzed things together and um we often talk to each other you know as as often we, as as we can um so he was very instrumental in in sort of that last piece that picked me up and went okay i've let you do this for as long as you want and i'm happy for you to continue and get this qualification but you will be moving like this and i went yes chef so peter howard was actually teaching you at tape yes yep i was there with peter at uh that would have been 1983 wow and you said that you were always trying to resist chefing mm. and and how did he stop that from happening i i, I think it was in his manner in in the way that he opened look in the way that he said there's a really good job going at edna's table i think you should apply for it well i've actually got a big surprise for you Oh my God, there's Peter on the line. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Peter Howard. Hello, am I connected up and are you seeing me and all that sort of we stuff? Don't, you know? We don't see you, but we can hear you. Oh, well, that's great. I can see you too. That's the most important thing. Peter, Peter, hey, how guys, are you, my darling? Hey. Well, so, have you got your video on? Me? Yes. I sure have. Oh, I wonder why we can't see you. Oh, uh, well, I more than likely haven't got the video on. Let me see. Oh, <laughs> it says start video. Let me do that. Does oh, that there video? you are. Hey, let me just get myself in. Oh, my God, modern technology. I love it. 
What a great surprise. What a great time to be there with you, Julio. Thank you. So it's a huge surprise. Very, very good. Well, thank God through this modern medium, we get to see each other, even though we can't get to see each other in person. Absolutely. Uh, this, is the, this is the very, very best thing. This is the very, very, very next, the, the, the very best next thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Pete, Julia was just uh, telling me about the role that you played in his early career during the tape days. Yeah, well, I suppose, uh, Julio, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great compliment that you think of me when I think of all the things that you do. And, uh, and, and, and I guess that's really the role that people like myself have had to take on. And it's one of the things that I've really enjoyed. And it's one of the things that, of course, the passion for food and for wine and for people in the business has driven us to do, and and for us to be able to impart information, to be able to us to for us to be able to share the passion that we do uh, in all our roles, in no matter where we are in our life, is really the most important lesson for us all. Absolutely, turned yeah. into a bit of a "this is your life" moment for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> See, if you hang around long enough, Julio, it's going to happen to you all. You didn't think it had ever happened, did you? No, you've got to be persistent, don't you? <laughs> yeah, they, but I mean, they, there are the... Go on. Sorry, go. They were amazing days, really, when I think that far back to 1982 and 1983, being that first intake class, not knowing a lot, and, and just having... I, You know, I don't know the words to use, but those lecturers, those teachers, not only were passionate, but they were, I think, down to earth. There was no messing yeah. about. You know, this is this is what you're moving into, and they gave you direction, either we, you know, either by being firm or flexible. But they knew their stuff. They really, really did. And I suppose the part about it too is to always remember where we are in our lives and always remember what's happening in there. And if you've got to remember 82, 83 was really the start of the revolution. It was the start of the food revolution. It was the, the, the start of uh, multicultural foods for us to look at ethnic foods and for us to embrace them outside of the, the very parts, the very first parts of uh, ethnic food that we knew, which was the Italians, the Greeks, the Spanish, uh, et cetera. But then we, in 82, 83, we started to see the influence of the Vietnamese and, and, and how uh, their food was starting to impact upon us, the, the emergence of all the Asian cuisines and, and the embracing uh, of this as, as this uh, way in which we let that food infuse into us. It was an extraordinarily important and a very, very exciting time for us to be alive. And you know, now we're re-exploring it in these days, 2021, we're re-exploring all those things and we're going and we we are delving deeper into it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah I, I, um, I, we've I, had, I, um, did you know, Pete, that Julio was born in Egypt? I did not know that. I did not know that. You've got to keep some secrets, Vanessa. <laughs> you don't have any secrets, Julio. I, I do have an Australian passport. I Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, we're very glad that you're here. I can tell you that much because can, of the influences I can tell you. that you have. Yeah, we're very happy that you're here. Excellent. I'm, I'm more than stoked uh, for being here. I, I, um, I'm a firm believer that this, and having travelled a little bit, not a lot, we are... Uh, we are the top of our heap, mate. We we are the top of the heap. It is a brilliant country to be in, um, yeah. and we sell ourselves short in the culinary field quite often. Um, and I think it's because it's our nature to do that. You know, yep. um, and we've got some great talent all around us. So, do you think that's because we lack a sort of like a cultural confidence? You know, and and I often wonder it's because we've had so many influences on us, whether we've actually really ever come to grips with 
you know, when we use the thing, the, the term Australian cuisine and whatever, and there's been a lot of people poo-hooed that, a lot of, but we have done things our own way. We have done things our own way. And I, I have to agree with you. As a side note, I'm not a Kiwi, but I almost know the haka. Yeah. It, it, and, and there's something about growing up in New Zealand when you can sing your national anthem in Māori as well as mm. English. So as Australia, as a culture, we're, we're probably, we're so old, but so young still. And we, we didn't embrace those roots early on in the piece, I think. And yes, that lack of identity caused us to be multicultural, which is a good thing, but still did not give us an opportunity to firmly plant a root. We'd been hesitant all along. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. But I suppose that in my time, I was very lucky because I had to learn all the different culturals. We knew had we had to know how to do a stir fry. We had yeah. to know the difference between you know the different curries from Thailand. All those sort of things we had to know. And we had to know you know where the best uh, where the best salmon came from in New Zealand, which uh, I always remembered was Stewart Island down the very base of New Zealand. And we had to know all that sort of stuff because it was emerging. Yes. And it was so exciting. It was so exciting. You know, it was that was the thing. And even now in what we do, and, and I look at the backdrop behind you, and I look at all those different chilies, and I go, oh, my God, there's a Scotch bonnet there and whatever. Uh, you, in 1980, certainly in, 19, certainly in 1970, you know, when I went to East Sydney Food School, after having been demobbed from the army, um, and even when I was in Vietnam in the army, like we didn't see any of the Vietnamese dishes because we, well, we simply didn't. And we won't go down that line. But, you know, and I look at all those things and how much we know now, Julio, and how, when I worked with you last time, which is now, oh gosh, it's now, you know, believe it or not, it's three years ago that we were yeah. together, you know, with the ACF and you were lecturing and Vanessa was lecturing and I just sat back and I thought, oh my God, look at this man's philosophies and look how they've developed and look how he's absorbed everything that's happened around him. And that happens for a reason, Julio. And then it happens that you are where you are and it's for a reason. And I think that's the important thing for us to embrace and to keep going forward with the message because there are a lot of things that still have got to be explored a lot of things still yet to were to be told yeah for sure the journey has only just begun it has I believe it was three years ago that we were all together <clears throat> it was yeah. three years ago vanessa it's gone so fast hasn't it well, I mean, look at where look at what we've been through in the last um three years it's it's just unfathomable to think of you know how long it it's is. Been. Oh, we look forward to seeing you, Pete. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait, but I mean, there are so many things that you we could talk into. But this is Julio's time, and this is for us our time to embrace and uh, and be re, and be joyful at what Julio has achieved and where he's going, and what he's doing. I mean, he's only a young man yet, and uh, you know, even though you're only sixty-seven, you'll be fine when you get there. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Julia, I could I couldn't resist that one. You weren't far <laughs> off. So, so I doubt it. I doubt it. As soon as I read your notes yesterday, Julio, I thought, you know what? I, I mean, as much as I love to hear about your journey and and to hear how it all started and all the rest of it, I think at this time it's also important that we remember. Um, what you've given to the industry and the people that you've connected with. And when I reached out to Pete and I just said, Pete, would you be interested in coming on and having a chat with Julie and I, Julio and I today? Straight away, Pete's absolutely, Vanessa, I'd love to. So, you know, I just think at this time when we're all a bit isolated, it's nice to see a friendly face. Yeah, it's very nice. A little tear in my eye, but um, I'm holding him back. Do you think I the thought thing it is was. That... I was like, has he got the light shining in his eye? 
And you think, I mean, think the thing that joins us all together, even in this way, no matter which, is, is this passion and this love of food and the love of wine and the hospitality industry that has joined us together uh, in so many different ways. I mean, without this magnificent hospitality industry, you know, we would not have these friendships that we have, the friendships that we enjoy and the friendships that we bask in. And I think it's just so important to always understand that if we, if we did not have the business we're in, we wouldn't have had the great joy of knowing each other. Would it actually agree. goes beyond friendship, doesn't it? It actually becomes a family. We are actually Absolutely. a family. I agree. I not agree. Not yeah. Anymore. You know, there's always been a, a poor slant on hospitality. You know, you work too hard. You don't get paid enough. You're always working at night and the weekend. I say to you, I have met the most amazing people at night and at the weekend. I have dined at the most amazing play, places when there's been no other soul around apart from the four chefs and the owners of a, of a restaurant. I've been to Chinatown at, at times of the morning having the most amazing combination short long soup, you know, at four o'clock in the morning. I've, I've built a team around me that just became inspired and passionate about good, wholesome cuisine. And that was never, ever going to happen nine to five, Monday to Friday. Never, ever, ever. And, so, and also it wouldn't have happened without great people like Mr. Peter Howard. Um, correct. Inspiring us and, 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 bring, and pushing. bringing us and making us love food. <laughs> yeah. You know, following, yeah. following your career, Pete's been, been amazing. I, well, absolutely. it's been a fabulous time. And, I mean, I just, and I am just so thankful that I have gorgeous young people like you in my life, you know, who who include me in things like this. I mean, this is such a compliment. That's the other thing for us to always remember that, you know, what goes around comes around. And it is just so marvellous to see you, Julio. And um, I wish I could get a screenshot of that. Uh, of that oh, here, yeah, I'll take one and I'll send it to you. <laughs> I love it. But I'm going to leave you guys get on with this because uh, you have other things to do, I believe, Vanessa. And, I actually uh, do. I've got a lot of surprises up my little sleeve yeah. today. Oh, my okay. goodness. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to leave you because I now write novels and I need to get a couple of thousand words down this afternoon in my next novel. So um, I'll get on to you, Vanessa, when the next I one is coming out. I can't wait for and, that book. And, I love your yeah. books. Okay. All righty. Good Thanks, to see you. Congratulations, Julia. You're an Thank amazing you. man. Good on Thank you. you so much. And thanks, Vanessa. You're gorgeous. Thanks, thing. thanks for asking me. Love you lots. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye now. Bye. So that was a lovely surprise, wasn't it? So what have, what have we learned, Vanessa? You're untrustworthy. That's what we've learned. <laughs> <laughs> well, not really. I'm all about you know making people yeah. realise how amazing they are. Oh uh, right. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. So. Uh -huh. Yeah. Our next person. <laughs> yep. We've got a nice little surprise now. Oh my God. <laughs> Miss Melody Price Dawson is here to say good day. People won't, people, she's connecting to audio. <laughs> I was only talking about her on Tuesday. She's a pretty amazing lady. There you're she on mute, is. my love. Hi, you're on mute. <laughs> talking. I wasn't talking yet. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm, I'm good. This is like, as I said, this is this is your life. This is amazing. <laughs> It's a, is there someone going to present me with a book at some stage? Well, I would have, but I didn't have enough time. <laughs> oh, Vanessa, really? Oh, no, I know. Yeah. I really let the team down. Sorry. I'll just make that note. <laughs> oh, very so, nice. Melody, well, I, I reached out to Melody because I know that you and Melody have shared some really fun, um, funny times, and you've shared a, a long You've been friends for a long, long time. And I know that Melody doesn't really feel, she doesn't enjoy doing these sort of things and, and being 
you know, being in front of a lot of people, but just tell us something from your time gone by that was funny that you that you can share with us. Mm, how PC does it have to be? It doesn't yeah. have to be at all. So Julio came to my wedding, which he strongly advised me against participating in. <laughs> <laughs> And then proceeded to give me the world's last. She's gone silent. And really, really big. What was that? Have you lost me? Somebody just tried to ring me, which is really annoying. He gave me the world's largest pepper grinder for my wedding gift with all the necessary connotations that go with it. Um, did, you take, did you take that with you, Melody? I did. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? The pepper grinder lasted longer than the marriage. <laughs> oh, very funny. Don't I, worry, um, we've all been there, done that. I, as I said, I, I spoke about Melody uh, only a couple of days ago to a team of people. And um, we were talking about sales and, and what goes on. And um, I chose her as someone that I totally respected uh, in the olden days. And although she was, and still is quite a sexy creature, she had an honesty about her that I don't have words for. I would say, where does that come from? And she had the ability to say, I don't know. I will find <laughs> out for you. And I, I, I know, you know, it may not wash with some people, but I thought that was the best person to do that job because she would find out, she'd get back to you and let you know what you needed to know. No rubbish, made-up story, you know, on the hop. It was fantastic. And I told all my guys to take a leaf out of that and go, hey, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And I, I remember that really, you know, quite clearly, Melody, that, that was just endearing the fact that I've never done meat before. I will let you know. It was great. She's a bit of an inspiration. Later, I still don't know. <laughs> Formula's working perfectly then. <laughs> so how long, how long, how far back does it go that you guys have known each other for? I don't know. Two thousand. 2000, maybe a bit earlier. Is 2000 good? I think it was about 98. Okay. Yeah. I think we might be showing our age, but I think yeah. it's that far back. I think it was about 19 or 20. Wow. Yes. Yeah, you were, you were very young. I think you were 19. So whenever that was. Here we go, guys. And did you um and you met when your when you were at Master Cup Melody and you were chefing Julio? Yes. Yes, I, I think maybe Landmark Park Royal. It was. Yeah, the park, yeah, Landmark Park Royal. With, and then then with Glenn the, uh, Crum. Oh, sorry. With Glenn Crum? Yes. That's it. So it must have been a. Alternatively, it was before that at the Centra Hotel in North Sydney. Possibly hey. that too. Yeah. Whatever it was, Ness, it was a while ago. And it was always around food, which is what we love. Yes. So how did you go this week? You weren't in at the Glenory Woolworths, were you, Melody? No, I kept my snake at home. <laughs> did you see the big python that was at Glenory Woolworths? No. Yes. It was on the news yes. this week. There was this massive python in the spices at Glenory, which is where I used to live and it's where Melody lives. And, um, yeah, it was just. Is this the one that was stolen from 
Norellan pet world many years ago? No, this is a good old fashioned garden variety oh. diamond python that I think someone took in for a bit of fun. Right. Release the snake. The hounds or the snakes, whichever. How funny. So yeah, Melody and, I, Melody and I go back quite a while, you know, and yes, it has always been around the food. Um, and, you know, she's got triple long service up her sleeve here at MasterCard. Um, look at it. And she still looks fantastic. She still looks after, like she's 18. Oh. Uh, you still look like you're about 18. I love having friends that need glasses. It's perfect. Yes. I've got my glasses on. I can't even see. I can't see anything anymore without wearing glasses. Yeah, you're right, though. No. These new prescriptions, I, I need to sort them out. <laughs> so you're going to hang around, Melody? I am. I'm going to watch. Oh. That's good. Into a bit of voyeurism. Aren't yes. I, Julio? Lovely. I... My favourite, as you will know. <laughs> so anyway, getting back to yeah, um, sorry, get, getting back to G-rated. Yeah. So you you're in, you had a pretty high influence with um, this is a bit like this is your life. <laughs> so you had a so Peter Howard was a big influence on you, and I'm sorry that I tried to rush through to that point because I was expecting him come in at that time so I was trying to get up to Peter Howard really fast that's okay Can you take us back to to where you felt comfortable I mean um I think it was that you were you, you'd always resisted the industry and being a chef etc so so take us on a bit of that journey uh, and I think you know when I got to that TAFE situation and and Peter had you know found this job for me I, I discovered I discovered some different flavors and I knew that doing that apprenticeship would lead me into, into cooking. But again, as I said, the first job after qualifying, uh, actually I went to Wassell's Hardware in, in Matraville. I, I'm a fully licensed timber grader. Go figure. I can tell you about DAR dressed all around timber all day long. You know, uh, rough saw in Oregon, the whole thing. I mean, I'm, I'm there for you. Um, Isn't it amazing, though, that we can, um, I'm the same. I'm actually a fully qualified nail technician. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was so over the whole chefing thing. I wanted some glam in my life. So I took myself off and did a nail course and was doing nails in a salon. And here I had to put up with women coming in saying, I've broken a nail. And it's like, like I care. Yeah, get over <laughs> it. <laughs> so I was quickly back into the kitchen. But it's funny how the kitchen always draws you back, isn't it? Yeah. You know, again, being a waiter, hanging around the kitchen, went to the trade winds at Maroubra. And at that stage, there was a nightclub there called Bodine's. And so I was the cocktail barman at Bodine's because of course, the course that I did, the associate diploma gave you that bar experience. And, you know, we were making grasshoppers and fluffy ducks. I mean, you know, it was a long time ago and whiskey sours and all those oldie worldy things that used to just be so, you know, they'd go off. Anyway, there was one night in particular where at this stage, no one knows that I'm actually qualified or, or can cook and one of the chefs had an accident in the kitchen and it was a little bit slow in the nightclub cocktail area but food was going off so they came out and said can someone give us a hand I went oh look only a couple of hours left on this shift I'll, I'll come and give you a hand it's okay so I, I got in there and as I said you know it was like two and a half years later I left the kitchen um, and I only, I, I left the kitchen, got excited about what I was doing. Uh, you know, the memory of, of trade wins was <laughs> the executive chef having a drink and a cigarette whilst on the grill. And there was salt and pepper 
and this magical stuff that used to turn everything into an amazing flavor. What was this magical stuff? So yes, I started off in my first cooking role with MSG. <laughs> It was mind bending. I didn't know what this is. What is this? I must get myself some of this. This is just a pepper sauce. No, look at it. <laughs> what did you so, use it for? Every single thing that that kitchen produced out of that grill had just that little bit in there. I didn't know any better until the beauty manager, Len, left and took up a job as the duty manager at the Camperdown Travel Lodge. And that, that my friends, that was the first place that I actually walked into and I went, ah, took my breath away. <laughs> uh, and I know you're all thinking, really? Camperdown Travel Lodge? But in, in those days, it, um, the Clay Pot Restaurant had an amazing name for itself. Um, Tony Carter was a brilliant chef. Um, as I said earlier, you know, ahead of his time, and there was the first time that I walked into a brigade system. And I would love to be able to bring more people through that system because passionately, the demise of a, a lot of our industry is because we can't afford a brigade anymore. And that- Yeah, very well. Is it because we can't afford it or we can't find it? I mean, at the moment, we've got, you know, um, such a skills shortage of finding people. You know, we, we're losing people hand over fist, which is a lot of the reason why I wanted to start these sessions in the first place was to advocate and to, to remember why it was that we came into this industry. Don't be so quick to give it up. It, there's other areas that you can go into, which is, you know, both of you have gone into sales roles. I've gone into sales roles. I mean, I'm now doing marketing and you're doing sales and marketing as well. I mean, Melody, you do you do some marketing and, and you've also got your dog grooming business. But but you can do other things in this industry, which I think is um, which is amazing. It's, it's a really big, complicated issue and... I know that some people out there, if there's anyone out there, I know how I feel about some things because I am very passionate about some things. The simple fact is that I have to let go of some of my hangups because people will say there's a skill shortage. You're probably right. You're probably right. But there's not a warm body shortage. So we, we can find people to do a job. And through the years, that deterioration of that party system, what the brigade used to look like and how it became a family, and it became a family because at five o'clock, you'd sit down for dinner together and one yeah. of the apprentices would cook. Or at 10 o'clock, you'd all get together and have brunch and someone would make something special with the eggs there was a family unit. There was also an, a, an opportunity to start off at the bottom of the ladder and get all the way to the top. And most of the time, you couldn't come in halfway through. Now you can come in with only one step left on that ladder. And that's the hard part because we're not nurturing we're not preparing people. You know, M Melody would come into the office at Darling Harbour and there may be an apprentice sitting behind my chair, you know, and I'd say to Aaron, picking on him, I'd say, Aaron, it's time for you to leave. I I've taught you everything that you could possibly learn. You've got my chair, you're on my computer, you're writing everything out. It's, it's over for you, you know, and this is Aaron as a second year apprentice. And we don't talk to people like that anymore. So Aaron gets up and goes, sorry, chef, back into the kitchen and does what he needs to do. We, we don't, it's not like talking to people. It's not what I really meant. What I meant is we don't develop them 
enough to move into the next position and the next position. Um, at the moment, we, we, you know, my catch cry is you qualified at, at 20, maybe 21. If you're lucky, 22, you get your first job, usually walk into a chef to party's position because crikey's, we need somebody. Let's just take it. Great, get in there. You know, you're 22 at a chef's to party position. You're, you're 24, a couple of chefs have left. At 24, you're the executive chef. At 26, you've got a cluster of hotels. And at 30, you're trying to kill yourself because it's just all too much for you. We've not let anybody develop slowly enough. We, we, we push them so quick, so fast, so hard to get in that top rung. And when I say we, the collective we, and that's also entrepreneurs as well. You know, they need the best bang for their buck. So I understand that concept. But there was something about how we used to do it in the old world that gave you a really good grounding. Um, you know, the chefs that I still remember, you know, my first, when I started in the kitchen, one of my first chefs was 65 years old. He was the exec chef. And the sous chef was 50. But I don't know. I don't know any of those. I don't know any of those at the moment. No. It, it was a different world that we lived in. And there was a passage before you got to that position. You know, if you were the, you know, the exec chef at 30, well, that was pretty serious. Yeah. Uh, you know. But even if you were put on the grill, um, you know, that that was a pretty big move as well. You know, it was every time that you were developed to go into a new role, um, what, it was like a, you know, you always, you always had a stripe on the, on the patch of your, uh, yeah. your chef's jacket because you'd work to get to that point, whereas now, yes, you're absolutely right. But I just can't help but think about, you know, what it would look like if we were to step back and and as you said before, you know, allowing people to have the time and, you know, it's a pretty big issue when we look at the skills shortage and and just um, looking at ways that we can work around it. We know what it is. Like, what are we going to do about it? You know, um, it, it's kind of like, for me, I'm just kind of like, why don't we focus more on that mature age group as opposed to trying to drag young kids that have already made their mind up from their parents that they're going to go into university? It's a, it's a really valid point, and I, I tend to agree. Um, there's no, it's, it's never too late, never too late to start your apprenticeship. And it's especially never too job late. share, you know. Absolutely. Like that's, that's also a really good point, you know. Um, that is really, really good. And there's also an ability, and probably not COVID times, but there's also a great ability to be able to do shared work amongst more than one property. Yeah, 100%, like a co-op. Like, yes, like a co-op. I, I was blessed at that Camperdown stage. You know, Michael, sorry, um, Tony Carter employed me. Michael Green prom promoted me to the sous chef's position. And Mark Drondrak, as I say, Mark, Mark taught me how to mix sweet and sour together and just open my palate. Do you mean, Mark? did you say Michael Green? Yeah, Michael Green. Recently parted recently uh yeah do you, do you remember michael green do you, do i do remember? yeah yeah michael passed away uh, a couple of months now earlier in the year oh really uh, i didn't hear yeah. that yeah very sad very sad that was um very very sad he um he gave me a break he he saw potential and he went mate before i leave this is what i want to do because he was taking over uh the brand new property out at Parramatta. Uh, the, the travel lodge out of Parramatta, and um, so yeah, it was it was an amazing thing. But having been at Camperdown gave me an opportunity to work in you know there was an Auburn travel lodge, there was a Parramatta travel, lodge. there was most amazing places around, you know. So we have our next guest who's only been trying to get in here for the last fifteen minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> my fault, Jody Savio. <laughs> God. So I've been trying to watch you. I've been trying to listen to the conversation, try and fix these bloody technology problems. <laughs> like, uh, what do I look like? And 
computer geek. <laughs> Good. Welcome, Mr. T Antonio. How are you? Oh, no, he's frozen. <laughs> I'm just like... <gasps> you caught him smiling. Well done. <laughs> you know, only when you freeze, you got your mouth open or something, haven't you? Very good. Come on, Tony. Come on. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Come on, Antonia. But anyway, for those of you who don't know who Antonio Savio is, uh, he's the president of the Federation oh. uh, the Italy Chefs. Oh, there he is. Take yourself off mute. <laughs> Hang on. His, his role has changed. Take, take yourself off mute, Tony. Oh, Hello. Hello. Yes, Antonio, give us your new title. Can you, my new title? I'm just what? board member. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's, well, he's, welcome. Yes. <laughs> so, um, look, I reached out once again, uh, and I know that with the... Uh, the Culinary Federation, and just as chefs, that you have a really strong relationship with Tony and you're all both very supportive of each other. And I just reached out to Tony to see if he wanted to join us and just say a couple of words in recognition of your friendship and um, the role that you've played in his life as well. <laughs> anyway, we'll come back. We'll come back to Tony. <laughs> Can I can I just say yes while we're waiting for Tony to join us again that with regards to getting people back into the industry because I think society today particularly the younger people don't like the hard work they don't like the really excessive hours they don't like having to work on a Saturday night and all those sorts of things hello oh he's back I don't know what's going on just let Melody make her point now. Sorry. I was just going to say that maybe I've got a couple of clubs who are doing four-day weeks and things like that to soften the blow of how tough this industry is. And instead of trying to change the people we want to get into the industry, maybe we have to change the industry to fit in with them because the millennials are a little bit different to how we are and they certainly wouldn't do the hours that we all used to do. So if we can massage it and make it more manageable for them so that they can have a life and be in the industry, it might be a way of encouraging them back in as opposed to the, you know, the catch cry that chefing is hard slog and yes, you're going to work Mother's Day and Christmas Day and Saturday night. Yeah, 100%. Um, a lot of businesses have now started to take on that four-week um, business model, which is <clears throat> really positive and good to see and you're absolutely right it's um it, it, it it's like if, if everything else hasn't worked you know maybe we need to look at um another option which is as you say looking at the industry to fit in with that um demographic the hard part is is and always has been that hospitality seems to be a seven day a week operation and that causes grief. There's a lot of factories that don't open on a Saturday and a Sunday. You know, I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to own a restaurant. Well, if I ever wanted to own a restaurant, I would have said we're shut on Sunday and Monday. You know, everybody gets two days off. And it's, it's the guarantee that people want. It's the certainty, you know, and they want that flexible roster that says, you know what, you do get a Saturday off every month. Plan for it. That's your Saturday. Hella high water, you're going to get that off. But we don't. We, we're so reactionary. And we go, oh, we'll take that. We'll take that. Yep, yep, yep. And they do that in Europe. They do that. Restaurant A is closed on Saturday and Sunday. Restaurant B is closed on Sunday, you know, and so on. So as to make sure that everybody, A, gets an opportunity to be open, but also B, has forced leave for the staff because otherwise you do end up with people working every single weekend and Absolutely. people don't want to do that anymore. Absolutely. 
Hell yeah. So. Just when I thought Antonia was going to be there. <laughs> so did I. I'm just like, are you going to take yourself off mute now? Oh. Tony, mute. <laughs> uh, unmute yourself, Tony. Bravo. Uh, oh, there you go. Uh, I think we've got you now. Okay, Tony, go. Ridiculous. Today, my phone wants to play games with me. This is why we love you. So tell us, um, you know, as, <laughs> as I was saying before, I wanted to, you and Julia have had a long friendship and a, a mutual respect, and I thought it would be nice to have you on here to um, just tell us a little bit about that. Uh, look, when I met Julia, it was about three years ago when I was president of the Australian Culinary Federation. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm watching myself on a big screen and a small screen. I'm just going to. Yes, I watch yourself. <laughs> no. Nah. Uh, look, uh, when I became the president of the Italian uh, Culinary Federation Australian chapter from Italy, um, I I um, thought, look, I need to connect with the ACF, the Australian Culinary Federation, and we connected with uh, President Doyle and uh, with uh, the New South Wales President Julio. And Julio invited me to the competition of the clubs at Ride, uh, Ride TAFE, where I went to TAFE, um, not doing chefing, but we went to TAFE there. Um, and he just took us in with open arms, with. Um, with Chef Adam Moore, they both um, was an unbelievable feeling to be welcomed by um, peers that um, were above and beyond that I uh, loved, um, that I connected with. Um, to see the competition from the RSL clubs, uh, chefs, and Julio leading us go through every stage with him, how everything was run and and happened. It was just unbelievable. And then being part of that world of um, association life, because we we like to give and we are not uh, remunerated, like we are not paid for that going to an association. We do it because we love the connection with people and being in the food industry just gives you an, another dimension. And um, I've loved it. I've loved the journey with Julia. Julia has uh, given me a lot of feedback on a lot of things. Um, with everybody in this industry that I've connected with, um, I found a place that I um, love to connect with other chefs and talk about things. Um, yeah. Sometimes. You just need to talk, get advice, um, and it's just been, uh, yeah, the three years that I've been dealing with Julio, um, it's been unbelievable. Now that I'm not the president of the Italian Chef Federation, but still involved with the, both federations, so, you know, just both on the, on the committees, you know, I had to take a step back for my own health because there's a lot of um, pressure in this industry. And, uh, but um, look, during this COVID lockdown, we see a lot of different changes and I totally agree with chefs uh, having a Saturday off and a Sunday off or a Sunday, Monday. That's how I ran my restaurant at Puntino. I made sure my chefs got to have weekends, two days off. You had to have two days off. I didn't care. Even if they cried, I need to make money, I go, yeah, but you need to have a life. I'm the first that you got to have work-life balance in this industry. You need to have work-life balance with family and with friends. Very important. Thank you. And now we've got another... Sorry, I just kept um, on going. You what? Sorry, I kept on going talking. No, you're fine. It's just a, do you know what? It's taken so long to get you on there that I like, <laughs> I'm just like, you just say what you got to say. Um, I want to give you, you Julia a big hot hug with those chilies. 
but thank you for sharing those uh, nice words um, about Julio. And he definitely has been a pillar when it comes to that association and, and creating stronger connections in the industry. But um, another person that, that I know holds a great deal of respect for you, Julio, is, um, is Kurt von Buren. So Kurt has joined us as well. So um, hi, Kurt. Hi, Anessa. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kurt. Hey. Hey, Julia. Hey. Have you got Have you got bad stories to tell, Kurt? From the oh old no, no, actually, <laughs> I, re I remember when I saw you the first time at the the good old Park Royal times, very at the landmark. Yeah, I was at the uh, airport Park Royal then. Oh my God, this was so. Uh, 20, 23, 24, five years ago. I just came down from South Mall Island as executive chef and they got transferred because my wife was uh, pregnant. So I got a transfer back with the Park Royal to the airport Park Royal. And I was there for three years and I met you in the landmark. I met all the Park Royal chefs. That time, you know, SBAC was probably one of the best chains to work for. We had regular chefs meeting, you know, what's going on in all the hotels. We had internal uh, apprentice chefs competition. This was the best, you know, it was, we were well looked after. We had a lot of training, you know, I had, every month they had training, some kind of training, train the trainer and supervise the training, all that stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we were lucky enough to remember all these times. And since then we all, you know, stick together you know and then keep knowing each other for that while yes. you know even like melody you know remember these times and <laughs> the, you know and when you run i had a lot probably every week or twice or three times at them uh, delight flights and they gave my suppliers like two hours notice five o'clock in the evening hey i need meat or chicken or vegetable for 200 people coming in two hours i remember you know a few of you and um, and all the, um, you know, uh, Mastercard came with the private cars, the, the boot full of uh, sirlines and things like that. So that was amazing. Even, okay, I was lucky enough. Uh, I was at the airport and every um, supplier was in a radius of 5Ks. So there wasn't too much of a problem. But yeah, I remember these times very well. So you needed supply for a competition yeah. that you needed to take product for? No, for delight flights. Oh, you know, when the, yeah. The, that time, so you had all of the crew and all the passengers come and stay in the hotel. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't, they, somehow the, the plane couldn't take off. So the, every hotel was sort of 50%, 60% full. They got the delight flights and they split up the people, you know, there's 100 people going to the, you know, Park Royal, another 100 people going to the Hilton or, you know, the Sheraton at I the airport. I always wondered how the hotels manage that because when I was going to Vietnam, our flight got delayed and we ended up being sent to the um, the Novotel Darling Harbour. You know, okay. there, would, there would have been like 500. Or, like, it would have, was a big flight. I mean, maybe yeah. not 500, but there was a lot of people on the flight. And I often wondered, like, how do hotels cope with that amount of people without any notice? Hmm. Now they, they ring us first and say, can you take 200 people? And they said, occupancy, occupancy is 50%. So say, yeah, of course. And for us in the months of end, budgeters was always the big joke how the light flights. They were, they were never the inclusive. So everything came on top was, um, was a bonus for us. Absolutely. Plus we had them um, at the once a month, we had the shoppers on the yes. Saturday morning. Remember yes. them? You know, yeah. they came, we had truck bus loads of people, like 50 per bus, and um, they came for the cheap buffet. But what they did all day, they did uh, shopping in the Alexandria area, you know, uh, factory outlets, and they came to us for lunch. We got, we got $11 per person. Uh, we didn't make money, but it helps the revenue. My record there with four buffet was 950 people. That's and, amazing. Uh, and we had buffet in the bars, in the lobby, upstairs, everywhere we had buffet. The bus loads just came 50 at the time, and it was just amazing, you know. <laughs> so these, these people that he talks about, remember when you used to do the shopping tour? 
and yeah. you go to all the factory outlets? Yeah. Well, part of the tour was lunch. So Kurt would get all these That's guys. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Kurt would get all these, you know, and cheap. But it had to be good because the complaints, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I actually forgot about those because we used to take the bus from Newcastle and it was like when I was a young mum and they used to do these, like, fundraiser yes. tours. Yes. And we used to go to Alexandria and do all the factories. That's it. And then we went That's to... One. And then we went to the hotel at um, Surrey Hills. Yeah. yeah. We went there for lunch. I thought he's a, he just brought back some really fond memories. <laughs> yeah. Are going way back? That was amazing. We used to go back and the bus would be like, you know, shaking because it was full of so much stuff that everyone had bought. <laughs> Do yeah, they still yeah. have all those factories around Surrey Hills? Yeah, more around Zetland and uh, Botany Mascot. Yeah, absolutely. Still there. Wow. And um, so you guys have shared a, a pretty long friendship and, um, you know, and thank you, Kurt, for, for sharing a little bit of um, a memory and, <laughs> no you know, giving us yeah. a bit of insight into, the, into the, what you guys have shared. Um, so Adam Moore also sent a message, Julio. He, um, he has a, a board meeting on today, but... He wanted me to just um, read something out for you. And, um, you know, Julia made an impact from an early age for me as a young chef and now such an honour to have worked alongside Julio on numerous occasions since then. Julio is a passionate storyteller who loves a good tale and bad jokes, is extremely wise soul with many words of wisdom who is often closed off and private but an extremely loyal friend. Julio loves a good laugh, especially when you or I do something stupid. He makes amazing chocolates and tempting treats and also great travel companion overseas. Julio, your friendship and mentoring is extremely precious to me. Always Adam. So that was nice. Very nice. Aww. And um, I had uh, James Bolingle make me some bagels today for lunch. I have oh, my you got private, some, did I have you? my little private chef up the road and yeah, they were incredible, I might add. Uh, and he also sends his love and, and he, he adores you. Obviously, you guys share a very special friendship as well. Do indeed. And we've got... And um, I'm Mick going to... Um, <laughs> I'm just going to let you believe that they are the best bagels Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I forgot who my audience was. Sorry. <laughs> they're, well, anyway, they're pretty good. I can tell yeah. you. No, I you're right. Ones. The best, they're pretty good. They're okay. They're pretty average. They I had better. Amazing. They were terrible. Boo! They were amazing. Don't be saying that because he'll get upset. That, they, they, they were incredible. And oh, I even bought God. some smoked salmon and some creme fraiche and capers and red onion, and they were the bomb. Stereotypical locks. I thought some people may be doing it quite tough during lockdown. I don't think that lunchtime for me today is one of those times. <laughs> Very good. So how's your, um, so Kurt, while we've got you, how's your new venture going um, with the restaurant? You, you yeah. had to put that back? Yeah, I'm from Penrith, you only do a uh, uh, takeaway and delivery. Uh, we're working on a new concept, uh, the family box. So that's coming out soon, so you can cook it at home. Uh, we got three more. We got um, Campbelltown, is building. We got the uh, North Stratfield, and then we got the um, Cochra as well. So this is all at the moment a bit on hold because in Campbelltown they had to stop building. But that should be about eight weeks away. And then uh, we got one in Surface Paradise and one in Melbourne building. So the, the investor goes in really quick and hard with a lot of um, restaurants. All have the same model, all have the same setup, same menu. And um, yeah, hopefully we can open up. What, again. what about Warwick Farm, Kurt? Um, maybe that's on hold. We have to have a look because Warwick Farm is a quite investment. And, yeah. you know, for, for the same money, you can probably open other ones. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And the other question I've got for you is, how is that walk working? 
Which one? Remember you were telling me about the the automatic. Yeah, mod? yeah, yeah. We still um, we're still playing around. It's actually quite good. Um, the future is in the kitchen. The concept is you know you have six automatic wok and one person puts all the ingredients in, and the consistency, the quality. You know as we discussed before, you know, the shortage of uh, staff. You know and electric woks not complaining they're working seven days it's a small investment but it's i think you have to be smart about the menu and and the ingredients and i think uh, when you believe in it, it it could be the thing for the future fortunately but you know when when six electric woks replace uh, six chefs or four chefs you know to do one chef can that job and then especially when you set up a lot of restaurants, that's something we have to look into it, especially our investors. So mm. even well, um, in the front that. of house, you know, the robots, serving robots, you know, bringing the, 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 the trays on the tables. So we all play around with that at the moment. Very great. You got robots in your restaurant? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> we got one. We've they're got pretty, one where we amazing. They're pretty amazing. Around. It's, um, it, it. And then we have Mr. Eddie Espinel joining us as well. And um, Eddie's kind of new, I suppose. He's a he's a newer member to the Australian Culinary Federation, but he's he's also made a pretty big impact in the in the time that he's been with us, like with us. And I know that he looks up to you, Julio. And I just wanted to in, invite um, Eduardo just to say good day and and just to impart some of you know how, how much enjoyment he's getting out of being involved of the ACF etc with you yeah Hello. absolutely um thank you for having me Vanessa and um yeah um for the short time I have been um working with Julio um he gave me the opportunity to belong to the ACF as I also a member of the committee and in this short time, knowing him, wow. Um, every time I'm around him, he's just, um, I can feel his, um, his knowledge, his, his wisdom, and um, make you feel calm as well. And every word he said all, always comes with a, a big wisdom and knowledge. So he's like a, a Bible walking around in the, in the kitchen. Um, of course, I feel very, very humble in his presence and I'm very lucky to know him. And yeah, he's like an open book full of knowledge and not just him, everyone involved in the, in the um, ACF is, is, you know, have um, big knowledge. I think supportive as well, right? You know, I mean, you, you took a bit of a leap of faith and you joined the organisation and... Um, People kind of, they when they talk about the ACF, they, in the old days, I don't know how to say this, but I'm just going to say it. There was always this feeling that it was a bit of a click, that it wasn't inclusive. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that's one thing, Julio, that you have brought to the organisation is that inclusivity where you treat everybody with the same respect and, you know, you get in there, you stand beside them, you do the work and um, bringing chefs like Eddie into the fold and really sh opening, just really sharing your knowledge and your experience is just something that you just can't get anywhere else. I, I do believe that no one human being can do any of this stuff. You know, it's, it's that we have like-minded people and, you know, you must always look behind you to see where those footsteps have been. And people like Kurt, you know, they they were there at the beginning. We were we were there at the beginning, and we've seen a lot of evolution, and we've we've seen it meander, and we've seen it take a different course, and and we're seeing it now coming back to what it really needs to be, all inclusive. You know, very transparent. You know, I, I bang on, on on about a lot of things, but really the whole of the S ACF is is really about inspiring people and educating people. 
that that's all that's all you ever want to do inspire and educate you know and work as a, a family unit work as a team what the oldies do is they bring a little bit of structure into it so you don't lose those old world skills so we still talk about buffets and we still talk about you know mother sources and base sources that's not because that's the only thing we know it's because it keeps you know the, the momentum keeps the tradition mm -hmm. so yes thank you for those those words but i i do also feel that there are many people in this organization that have a common goal to to put hospitality front and foremost and also to create that bond that we should all have in hospitality i know karen's doing her best deb's a, a trooper the the state they're no longer presidents remember that guys the state directors and are, are doing unbelievable jobs you know and, and it's difficult every state has its own you know, perks, um, peculiarities, more so not perks, but peculiarities. So it's it's difficult, but we are a national body now. And I want everybody to be really happy about that. And, you know, it's about it's about representing now. Stand up and represent. Um, it's the easiest thing in the world is to change something from inside. If you stand on the outside throwing stones, you don't change anything. We just could, grow a thicker skin. Could not agree more. Could not. Want to change? More. Come on in. Be heard. You know, make yourself heard. Involve yourself, and and people will move. Things will happen. Um, can't be done from the outside. It just it just can't. So, you know, when with Eduardo, and and this is the beauty of what I've got here. I've got Kurt on one side and Eduardo on the other. You know, I've got the old bull and the new bull. You know, the, the new bull wants to run down there and do as many cows as possible. And the old bull is saying, stop, look around, you know, see what's going on. So it, it's a fantastic thing. Progress is being made. I cleaned that story up so much, Melody, didn't I? You had to use that analogy, didn't you? Yeah, you had to go there. Don't know why. It fits perfect. <laughs> So anyway, we're just about out of time. Pete Kenyon was coming on as well. He obviously was having some audio or um, some trouble getting into the session, but he also really was excited to be able to, um, to, to just acknowledge, you know, how much he enjoys working with you, et cetera, Julio. So please know that um, Pete was also looking forward to being here today. But one of the things that I love more than anything about uh, Julio is he makes chocolate. <laughs> and not, not just chocolate. It is amazing chocolate. Amazing. And beautiful too. It is beautiful. We, we actually uh, gave some away at International Women's Day this year. It was, um, you know, that was all made by Julio. It was beautiful chocolate. But anyway, he and I spoke during the week and um, Julio has been busy making some some bars of chocolate. Yeah, some bars. So what we've decided to do is, is that the first 20 people to put chocolate into the comment box, we will send you out one of Julio's beautiful bars of chocolate. Um, the people that are on the screen, don't you worry too much, but I'll organize to make sure that you, you do get sent a bar of chocolate. Um, and then I'll just have to come by and, uh, and and just reach out to get people's addresses to get those chocolate bars um, sent to you all so that you get to try his beautiful chocolate. And that will just be a gift from, from Food Logic to support Julio and, um, and just say thank you for everything that you do for this industry. It's it's wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's been um, wonderful. Look, I, I always knew that it was going to be fun trying to get everyone working in sort of like that whole introductory and come in and say good day. And anyway, we, we got there in the end. So that's all that matters. And thank you so much. Thank Very you, nice Vanessa. Thanks, yeah. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa. Do you have any parting wisdom that you wanted to leave us, Julia? Are you happy just to? Um, peace out. <laughs>
Bye, everybody. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Bye.